What we want to see is what I've called a property-owning democracy. So we want to help people own their houses. The goal of a property-owning democracy. The right for every family to have their own home. To increase home ownership by one million. A whole generation given the security of a home of their own. Reigniting home ownership in Britain once again. Giving millions of young people the chance to own their own homes. House prices have reached another all-time high. You'd hear a lot about people investing and saying, oh, that's just my pension. For someone who was trying to get on the property ladder, um, it made me quite angry. You had become a bit of a plaything in financial markets. Developers saw their profits soar and their share prices rocket. Investors and developers have got far too greedy. They've made far too much money out of people's homes. When I revert back to 2006, the idea you got to buy a home, push your finances to the extreme to buy a home, renting is a dirty word. I do look back with real anger. It's entirely the government's fault. Governments in this country failed to build enough homes. The thing that makes me angry is that it is a political choice. Nothing needed to have happened, nothing should have happened, that allowed this market to get to this state. There's one big piece of unfinished business in our economy, and that is housing. A greater Britain must mean more families owning a home of their own. Both David Cameron and George Osborne recognised that extending home ownership had been central to Conservative success. It was a, not just an electorally attractive thing, it was also, from their point of view, crucial to making sure that uh, the property-owning democracy should be advanced. And in our manifesto, we announced a breakthrough policy, extending the right to buy to housing association tenants. 1.3 million more people given the chance to become homeowners. A promise made, a promise kept by this government. Yes, from generation rent to generation buy, our party, the Conservative Party, the party of home ownership in Britain today. The nature of the offer to housing association tenants was one that would resonate with uh, the new coalition that uh, David Cameron and George Osborne were building. How do you feel about having the right to buy your housing association flat? Well, I'd quite like to, but I don't know whether I would at my age. Would I be allowed to at my <laughs> well, I, th I, think, I think you'd be allowed. Oh. Um, yes, I think it's a good idea. Housing association tenants would be allowed to buy their home at a big discount. Now, that would leave housing associations billions out of pocket, but the Tories say they've come up with a way to get round that problem, forcing local authorities to sell their most valuable council homes when tenants move out. That money would be used to build cheaper replacement council homes and compensate the housing associations. I mean, we were horrified when we saw what they were wanting to do. This was the time that people were, were beginning to understand just how bad the housing problems were and, and that it was, you know, government policies that were driving that. The policy really felt like an attack on what remained of the social housing system. It feels like the walls are coming in from all directions. The supply of social housing is shrinking. House prices are going up. Rents are going up. And that, that is a level of injustice that people will not stand for for much longer. He owns 
was his home. I own my home. Why won't we let those 1.3 million own their homes? Why not? What are you writing on? Obviously, if I could get the house cheaper or the flat cheaper, I would have. I would obviously buy it. I could buy this property for 172,000, but then I could resell it for 330,000. So I would have a very good investment. There was a pent up demand of people living in housing associated property who wanted to own their properties. So there was strong demand for it, there was strong political pressure for it um, coming through. We have a housing crisis of unprecedented scale in this country, but this housing bill will actually make the housing crisis worse. It wasn't just about trying to enable people to become property owners. It was rooted in a belief that this was not the state's role. The state should not provide housing to people who can't afford it. This bill would have resulted in the end of the social housing sector as we've always understood it. It was going to kill it off. Made onto the statute book, it was ready to go, it just needed to be implemented. Housing was an important issue under the leadership of David Cameron. But then I just think what changed everything was the Brexit referendum was called, or the focus went in on, on that. For the first time in four decades, British voters are to be asked if they want to stay in or leave the European Union. The date While ministers set. met, a crowd gathered. We are approaching one of the biggest decisions this country will face in our lifetimes. My mum live in a council house. My mum is disabled and needs bungalow. Immigrants have bumped up the list because of this. Am I right to want to leave? I wouldn't make that connection. If we have a housing shortage, we should build more houses. That's the how you would start. And you have not got enough houses now, so how the heck are we meant to house them when we haven't got enough houses now as it is? So where are you going to put them? The fact that we have to build one new dwelling every seven minutes just to cope with current rates of immigration. We're adding a city the size of Cardiff to the population of the UK every single year. In the run-up to Brexit, when I was reporting on the EU referendum, I remember travelling around the country and speaking to people about what was really on their minds, what was bothering them. And the housing crisis came up over and over again. Chancellor George Osborne has told the BBC that house prices could be up to 18% lower if the UK left the EU. I mean, for, for me, that is, a, that, that is a, an absolutely catastrophic economic mistake for our country. The Chancellor George Osborne says that Britain leaving the EU would cause a drop in house prices. Why should we think this is a bad thing? The British people have spoken and the answer is, we're out. I voted out myself, and one of the reasons was so property prices would come down, make it easier to come onto the ladder. Hopefully Brexit will bring the prices down a wee bit. That might be the one advantage, actually. A negotiation with the European Union will need to begin under a new Prime Minister. And I think it's right that this new Prime Minister start the formal and legal process of leaving the EU. Her Majesty the Queen has asked me to form a new government, and I accepted. So I was appointed Housing Minister in July 2016. I was actually up a tree in my garden, soaring off a branch when the Prime Minister called me up. So it was a slightly surreal setting for the conversation. The purpose was very clear that she wanted to give additional emphasis to housing as an issue. She wanted to elevate it up the political debate we were facing a housing crisis, that it, in many parts of the country, it was becoming increasingly unaffordable for people on quite decent jobs to be able to get on the housing ladder. And, and that that crisis also spilled over then into the rental sector as well in terms of uh, the affordability of homes to rent and, and people that were finding themselves homeless because they, they couldn't find uh, any property. If you're young, you'll find it harder than ever before to own your own home. If you have your own home that you worry about paying the mortgage, the government I lead will be driven not by the interests of the privileged few, 
but by yours. I think what I wanted to achieve was see if we could freeze house prices for a long period of time. What we were looking at was can we stop further house price inflation so that over time as wages go up, housing becomes more affordable. The Bank of England has cut interest rates to a new record low and warned of a sharp slowdown in the economy following the vote to leave the European Union. To help a creation of more money, £170 billion to be precise. Pumping it into the economy through so-called QE, quantitative easing. This is basically where a central bank creates electronic money to inject into the economy via commercial banks. As always, a loosening of monetary policy will be inclined to increase house prices. But I think the Bank of England didn't have a great deal of choice at that point, given that the Brexit vote itself was something of a shock to the economy and perceptions of the economy. We were not keeping supply up as a country with where demand was heading. And like anything, when you don't have enough supply, prices just keep going up and up and up. Now, housing is the big political hot potato, isn't it? 20 years ago, working people, on average, were paying around 3.6 times their annual earnings to buy a home in England and Wales. Last year, though, the average was more than double that. Over a period of about 30 or 40 years, governments in this country failed to build enough homes to meet the demand that there was. I mean, it's a simple market. The big developers must release their stranglehold on supply. It's time to stop sitting on land banks, delaying build out. The home buyers must come first. Building more homes is critical. Let's build the houses we need to ensure that Britain is a country that works for everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. In the early days of Theresa May's government, there was, unfortunately, there was an element of, you know, sort of, and it's a developer problem. The real problem is developers land banking, slowing things down, which is deeply frustrating. I was concerned that with some of the developers that they would get a you know, maybe planning permission for 10,000 new homes in a particular development. They would rather just leak some out, you know, a few hundred a year, uh, taking advantage of high house prices. We were saying to the developers that we felt we're holding on to sites for too long. If there isn't a good explanation, then we're not prepared to tolerate that behavior. When other people accuse you of slowing down something, you're desperately trying to move as fast as possible. That's quite difficult. There's always a balancing act around pace of development, but every site is being developed at a pretty healthy pace, and here's the range and why some are faster than others. And we've also been through this question a number of times over the years. The big developers claim that Whenever they get a plan mission, they build out quickly because that's their business model. Well, it's not. I mean, their business model is to maximise profit. I was very excited when I was at Shelter that the government had even started to ask this question because for years the assumption was it's just planning. If you give enough planning permissions, more homes will be built. And we had been screaming from the sidelines saying, you can give as many planning permissions as you want. Developers won't build them out if that means lowering the price because why would they? Dream of owning a home but need a little help? With Help to Buy, your deposit could be as little as 5%. Help to Buy is here to help. For details, go to helptobuy.org.uk. You know, it's hard to know whether policies like Help to Buy were just the result of ignorance, like economic illiteracy, or whether they were deliberately designed to favour property owners over everybody else. And loads of us were warning at the time, the IMF was warning that Help to Buy would push house prices up. I think the challenge with Help to Buy was that it was both necessary and unhelpful at the same time. 
<laughs> if your answer to the housing problem is supply, build more homes, then you have to be honest with people and acknowledge it's going to take years. So the question for any government is in the meantime, do you do some things on the demand side to help people get onto the ladder? And the danger, if you do, is that although you're helping some people, you're also pushing up the price further and making the affordability problem worse. That's the trap. Hello. There were people in the Treasury putting forward the economic case for ending the Help to Buy programme immediately. Indeed, I had to have quite a few conversations with myself about it. The problem we had by 2017 was that the economy was again placed under threat by the Brexit vote decision. So we were dealing with a situation in which the economy had new challenges and new fragility to manage. The economic outlook following the vote to leave the European Union is challenging, according to Mark Carney, the governor of the Bank of England. Leading economists, they now fear that there is this, uh, look at that, 50-50, 50-50 chance of the UK falling into recession. There was a credible case made that withdrawing the help to buy scheme completely with a hard stop would have undermined the housing market at a time when we were trying to protect the economy and support demand. Today, I can announce an extra £10 billion in funding to provide loans under the scheme through to 2021, helping an estimated 130,000 more home buyers over the next few years. When Philip Hammond further extended help to buy, it felt like we'd just been banging our heads against a brick wall. It's not helping first-time buyers at all. I mean, there's a stunning statistic here that says a government survey found that 57% have used help to buy could have afforded a house anyway. Well, it's driving house prices yeah, up. Absolutely. It's on the opposite of what the policy should be. I mean, help to buy is a con anyway. It doesn't really, you know, all the experts say it doesn't really work. Now, what about um, the sector as a whole? I mean, they've had a tremendous few years. Jolly difficult not to make money in the sector at the moment. The government obviously making huge efforts now to uh, build more homes. Red Rose share price is up 70%. Persimmon, 40%, and Taylor Wood Grove, 50%. It's about time that any government actually noticed that we've got a serious housing problem. And thousands and thousands of people simply can't afford housing. I was definitely aware that developers were doing well. To be honest with you, I didn't have a natural antipathy to that, right? If I want a developer to produce more and more houses, I need to make it worth their while. They're not a charity, they're not doing it for free, uh, right? So the fact that they could see a path to growth and to profit um, uh, by building more and more houses was, to me, a good thing. The fundamental problem is that land and housing are being used for profiteering. The government seems to have lost sight of the fact that the housing market need really careful management if they are to work in the interests of ordinary people. I bought my new build property in 2014 and me and my husband were really excited to be moving into our first brand new um, detached house. Um, it, you know, it was, it was our dream home. I knew it was leasehold, but the lady in the sales room said, don't worry, you can buy your freehold for a couple of thousand pound. So I never really thought about the long-term implications of what that would actually mean. Good morning, yet yeah, we're talking about leaseholds. Those affected don't own the land their houses are built on. Leasehold is a fundamentally unfair and ancient business um, model, shall we say. It's an aristocratic feudal one. Traditionally, houses have nearly always been sold as freehold properties, meaning the buyer owns the building and the land it is built on. However, there has been a growing trend to sell houses as leasehold, meaning the buyer doesn't actually own the land. Modern leasehold and the laws around it were really outlined in the Victorian era, and it was a way of preventing the Victorian middle classes from owning the homes uh, outright and always paying a ground rent to the uh, landowner. 
The nightmare began for me in this school playground, actually. One of my neighbours came up to me and said, um, our freeholds have been sold on. To be honest, I didn't really think much of it until she said to me, no, but Katie, do you understand what that means? And I said, no, I don't. No one had really noticed, including a lot of my predecessors, that quietly the development industry had turned the kind of leasehold system into quite a nice little earner. So we'd get developers, they'd build the development, sell the development on lease, have all these leaseholders, they'd taken the profit on the sale of the houses, but they'd also got the freehold, which they then also sold onto investment companies who could see the maths. They didn't ask us or consult us or anything at all. So then we thought, OK, so it would make more sense to go and buy your freehold because they said it would only cost a couple of thousand pounds. And they came back with £14,000. And, and, you know, I was, I was like, no, no, it can't be right. And slowly the penny started to drop and we realised that on that moment when they sold our freeholds from beneath us, everything actually changed. The most important thing to understand about leasehold is it just means a long tenancy. So you do not own the land, you do not own the building, you simply own time in that building. The point of the matter is that you are a tenant and the law will treat you as a tenant and you are considerably disadvantaged by that. Say I've sold you a property and then years later you found you were being hit by all sorts of charges and costs and limits on what you could do with it. How do you feel? Angry. If you wanted to change the carpets, if you wanted to change where the kitchen was, if you wanted to keep a cat, you would often have to pay a permission fee to the freeholder in order to do this. They realise what a massive second income it could create. And that is what leasehold is. That's, it is literally a blank cheque. I absolutely felt like I was missold and misled. And then I realised that things got a whole lot worse on our estate because half of the properties on, on the estate that were built by Taylor Wimpy had ground rent starting at £300 that was set to double every 10 years. The developers were putting in these little mathematical quirks into leases of doubling ground rents, right, that, that nobody had really thought was going to ever amount to a huge amount of money, but actually when you do the maths is, is big. My ground rent will double and double and double and double until it gets to £8,000 a year. Nobody had told us this. So actually in 2058, we'll be paying £8,000 a year in ground rent alone. And actually I will end up be paying long term about £182,000 just on ground rent alone. And all it is is a scam and lining people's pockets this meant that these houses were completely unsellable. I hate injustices, I hate, I hate being lied to, and um, if something needs changing, then I, you know, I'm, I'm determined to see things through to the end. I set up a little Facebook group. People were joining from London, from the North East, from all over. And I realised then that this was a national issue and the scandal broke. Katie Kendrick's campaign on Facebook has gone national and over 5,000 people who've fallen foul of the leasehold rules are fighting for a change in the law. Everybody's lives are on hold. They can't sell, they can't move forward, they can't buy their way out of this mess. Because of the doubling ground trend, our flat was valued at zero. PLC house builders, that is household name house builders, were up to this racket. They built them because they could make more money out of them. Campaigners say new legislation is desperately needed to stop people falling into a more expensive home-owning trap. And worst of all, these house builders were being subsidised by taxpayers' money through the Help to Buy scheme to, to create these toxic investment assets. So they cheated their customers and they took the rest of us for a ride as well. So I think, you know, I've always felt it was our problem. We, we got it wrong and I've always felt, you know, sort of personally responsible for that. We were clear that there was a real issue and, and also that it was our responsibility to deal with that issue. And we announced a review of the, the issue publicly and we then spent some time working out how many leases there were, who currently owned them, you know, what the right solution was for customers. This has literally taken over my life. 
I have got the most amazing family and husband, and I couldn't do any of this campaigning without their support. And if I can make it better for people by getting rid of it completely, not just for houses, but for flats, because what I've, I've, the people that contact me, the horror stories, it is absolutely heartbreaking. You're selling the freehold from out under them? Yes, Without their knowledge? Yes, we are. Right. They had to know it was a lease. The solicitor, there's no way they wouldn't tell them that it wasn't a leasehold property and explain the ground rent. For Simmons' main crime was spreading leasehold houses all over the country, even in geographic areas which didn't have any leasehold houses. For Simmons saw the advantages and the profit to be made out of spreading leasehold and used its persuasive sales teams to kick out leasehold houses. You ask for my reaction to Persimmon, it's complete contempt. Who can not feel contempt for Persimmon? They were cheating their own customers, basically, and paying their chief executive, what was it, a 110 million pound bonus he was set to receive, and he accepted only 75 million. So it shows what a sort of humble fellow he is. No, I'm sorry, uh, Persimmon reveals all that was wrong with the house building sector in this country. Give me your name and your title then. Yeah, Jeff Fairburn, uh, chief executive of Persimmon Homes PLC. And just uh, give us the spelling of Jeff. Jeff is J-E-F-F. OK. Persimmon's doing well this year, did well last year. Um, that was reflected in your bonus. Do you have any regrets about the furore surrounding that? I, uh, I think... Not. Yeah. I'd... Sorry. We're talking we... about the brick Obviously, the construction of the bricks, you know, follows on from how well Persimmon's doing, so I just thought the two issues were tied together, really. So I'd rather not talk about that. It's been well covered, actually, so... So you don't want to discuss that today? Are there any lessons, are there any lessons to be learned from that? It was the biggest bonus in the country. No? Yeah. OK. this country, I'm afraid, house builders are not struggling to sell their houses and they've treated their customers with contempt, I'm afraid, both in the sort of legal tenure that they've introduced into their housing, which creates an income stream at the expense of their former customers, but also building spectacularly badly. I mean, they were kicking out rubbish and, um, and, and getting away with it. Could this be the next house building scandal? A survey suggests a third of people who've bought newly built homes aren't satisfied with the properties. There's nothing there, the motor's completely disappeared. No rainwater pipes. We've had tiles falling off of our house, we've had tiles hitting our car. Insulation issues, damp issues. There definitely were concerns about quality um, in terms of new build homes. The focus was so much on quantity, on supply, on tackling the crisis. I'm not talking about dodgy kitchen units. I'm talking about major structural failings. The industry started to be criticised by first customers and then government. And I think much of that criticism was fair. I inspected the eaves and I found that the fire barriers were missing. Sleeping in a house when you know that you have these particular issues, it's certainly been stressful. I wanted a lovely home that I've always dreamed of, and it turned into a nightmare you can't imagine. You would have thought that they would behave a bit better um, in acknowledgement that taxpayers were propping up their profits. We've invested billions of pounds to get a small number of people onto the housing ladder, and this is how the house builders have repaid us. I 
I have just chaired a meeting of the Cabinet where we agreed that the Government should call a general election to be held on the 8th of June. Can you unite the country? The Conservatives say they will join forces with councils and housing associations to build thousands of new homes for rent if they win the election. Theresa May says she wants to fix a broken market. Why should anyone believe a word they say over the next seven weeks? All the parties pretty much are promising to build more houses, as parties do, just ahead of a general election. We've seen more than twice as much council housing being built. I want a Labour government that builds council housing. It was a surprise to hear Theresa May accept that we have a broken housing system. But I think they got to the point where they realised they could no longer getting, get away with pretending that the system was OK. If housing for people to buy has become increasingly unaffordable, they have to rent housing. And that increased demand for rental accommodation pushes up prices in the private rented sector. So that then manifests in more people going to their local authority and saying, I can't find anywhere to live and you need to rehouse me. And local authorities were telling us we're finding it increasingly difficult to find places to rehouse families. It wasn't about, oh, you, we just need to build more homes. It wasn't about, oh, there's just some middle class people that, you know, can't get on the, ho the housing ladder. The problem was happening at whole system level. So you couldn't just look at this as a problem with ownership or a problem with renting. The housing market is a whole thing and demand for one tenure impacts on demands for other tenures. In 2010-11, uh, there were, your first year in government, 60,000 affordable homes were built. May not be enough, but last year, it was 32,000. You've half the number of affordable homes. 1.2 million families are on waiting lists for social housing to rent. That's your record. Why should we believe a word you say? Well, actually, two things, Andrew. First of all, this is quite different to what we've been doing over the last few years. It is quite striking that the department that is responsible for affordable housing their budgets since 2010 have been cut by 62%. And all of that just gives you a very big clue as to where, in these governments' views, good quality housing sits. But we'd not invested enough money in our existing social housing for years. Social housing was regarded almost as a sort of, don't worry about it, it's not important, doesn't matter if it's mouldy, doesn't matter if it's unsafe. They don't have an overall majority at this stage. 314 for the Conservatives, 266 for Labour. Theresa May has played a high-risk political game and she appears she may have lost her gamble. I have just been to see Her Majesty the Queen and I will now form a government. A government that can provide certainty and lead Britain forward at this critical time for our country. So Theresa May walks back into number 10, still Prime Minister, but damaged, diminished, a smaller figure. Just before we leave you, let's show you these pictures just coming into us from West London. The London Fire Brigade has confirmed they're dealing with this serious fire in a tower block at Latimer Road. You can look at Grenfell Tower and see so much of what's gone wrong in the, the housing market, in the construction sector, this, this lack of oversight, this kind of freedom for, for industry to just pursue profit. Grenfell really is the pinnacle of what's been going wrong in social housing and in housing full stop. I moved into Grenfell Tower in 2001. Um, I'd been in uh, temporary accommodation with the council for a few years before that, living in a hotel in King's Cross. And 
Yeah, it was just, it was amazing. And we, you know, the flat was built at a time where they really respected the people that were living in these flats. I say that I probably knew a good 90% of the people that lived in the tower. And uh, um, so, yeah, so it was an amazing community. I was lying in my bed and the first thing that I was aware of anything was that I heard my neighbor's smoke alarm going over, peep, peep, peep. Went to my front door, kind of expecting to see my neighbor outside his flat saying, you know, I've set the fire alarm off, you know, smoke alarm off, I've burnt some toast or whatever. And in fact, as I opened my front door, I was just confronted with this wall of like black acrid smoke. coming out of the building and literally, I mean, I got out of the building at like 1.30, so it was half an hour after the fire had started and literally the whole of the side of, uh, the, of the building was already ablaze and people at their windows shining torches and it was, it, was, it was awful. It was really very awful. Guys, this is crazy, man. This is a building in London. Lambert Grove, West London, Latimer. Grenfell Tower. Grenfell Tower. We raised, over a long period of time, numerous concerns around fire safety. And all of these complaints were sidelined, not listened to. We were troublemakers. We're just hoping and praying like the crowds around us here that everybody has got out of this fire. I think that quite early we'd identified that our landlord was not capable of keeping us safe and that they were not being scrutinised by anyone and that something very terrible was going to happen as a result of that. And of course, on the night of uh, June the 14th, 2017, it happened and 72 people lost their lives. <laughs> There's definitely that constant kind of running theme, just social tenants particularly being not listened to. But there were deeper problems here too, and some of these did go right to the heart of, of government. Successive governments had a role in creating the conditions for the Grenfell Tower fire. Government from as early as 1991 knew that there, um, there was a danger from adding combustible cladding to the outside of buildings. Um, that it, it, it could result in, in fire ripping up the outside very fast. The area around the tower is littered with these burnt remnants of the building's cladding. Survivors will want to know why it was so flammable. Why didn't they do anything? I think the answer, as you look through it, is that ultimately they, they, they subscribe to a philosophy which prioritised the state not regulating, the state not intervening, allowing industry to make its own choices and effectively make its own mistakes. Um, and th the result was industry did, it did make its own choices and, and its choice was to, to, to use the cheapest product available. Had they spent a little bit more money and put non-flammable cladding on that building, we wouldn't be here having this conversation. The, the, the lack of respect for us went deep and, and had, had awful consequences. You know, as the cladding came off, not just at Grenfell, but all these other buildings, we saw how many corners had been cut. You know, where nails of one length had been specified, but nails much shorter had been used to save a bit of money, or where fire breaks that should have been between every floor had only been installed every other floor to save a bit of money. It's my understanding that a government's first duty is to protect the people, but you know, our government's duty was to ensure that businesses could make profit. The 
whole regulatory framework over which we presided was just totally inadequate. The successive governments have to take responsibility for that. Grenfell was such a moment of horror for everyone that finally it became the thing that made people think, we really have to do something about this. This is not acceptable any longer. And uh, an acceptance certainly in that government that what we'd been saying about the nature of the housing crisis wasn't hyperbole, it was just a statement of fact. After seeing the unimaginable tragedy unfold at Grenfell Tower, I was determined that we should get to the truth. Because Grenfell should never have happened and should never be allowed to happen again. Theresa May obviously saw the, both the horror for herself but also witnessed the anger of the people that lived in that area. It did, you know, imprint itself quite strongly on her. So when, for example, uh, the then Secretary of State James Brokercher and I were very keen to expand social housing provision, we got lots of cooperation for Number 10, they were all for it. Today, I can announce that we will invest an additional £2 billion in affordable housing. And in those parts of the country where the need is greatest, allow homes to be built for social rent well below market level, getting government back into the business of building houses. The Prime Minister, I think, was very keen to explore how we could do more. I'd been involved in conversations with her and she was perfectly happy for more money to come from the Treasury, but the guy running the Treasury said, you're not gonna get any more money. That was frustrating. The Treasury is always very skeptical of arguments, particularly if they come from number 10, that everything can be solved by spending more money. Sometimes problems can be solved by um, structural reform and some money on top, but very seldom by spending money alone. The House of Commons inflicts a crushing defeat on Theresa May's Brexit agreement. By the time I entered government, it's fair to say that the majority of government's attention was on Brexit and the ramifications of that. But that said, Theresa May was genuinely committed to her, what she called her, burning injustices agenda. The Prime Minister has once again suffered a heavy parliamentary defeat on her Brexit deal. And housing was seen very much as part of that. It was a, it was a chaotic and very, very you know, demanding time on government. They, there was not a lot of bandwidth for housing issues. Every now and again, you'd get a message down from the Prime Minister's office saying, have you got anything on housing? We need to do something about housing. For years, my dad had been fighting just to get into social housing. We had been in horrific temporary accommodation in the converted guard garage. So when he was finally offered, or we were finally offered um, the place on Eastfields, dad was, he felt lucky. But it wasn't fit for anyone to be living in. I knew that straight away. Conditions were absolutely slum-like, is the only way I can describe it. And we have cockroaches in the property. We had damp, we had mould, we had mice. We had lights filled with water. We had a bathroom which wasn't fit for use. My dad was complaining from the beginning. Please, can you come and fix it? And they completely dragged their feet. I mean, they didn't, they didn't sort it. The dad was diagnosed with stage one esophageal cancer. The nurses were absolutely horrified and disgusted at the conditions that were com coming to, that were having to come and treat him in. Um, and they would ask loads of questions about it. Why is nothing being done? Why is it like this? They were angry themselves that it was being allowed to happen. The doubters, the doomsters, the gloomsters, they are going to get it wrong again. We close the opportunity gap, giving millions of young people 
the chance to own their own homes. He caught an infection, um, and I have no doubt it was because of the conditions we were living in. And a few months later, in January 2020, he, he died. I thought, it's time things change. So I went in my home, took pictures, took videos, thought about what I was going to write, and uploaded a thread to social media, and it went viral in the space of an hour, I'd say. It was picked up by the local news. When Quajo's father was dying of cancer, he lived in a flat with issues including mouldy walls and a vermin infestation. It made a really bad experience much worse. I feel like I was ignored, my dad was ignored, my family was ignored. We have done a lot of work since to try and make sure that those conditions, um, the conditions within those homes remain habitable. Previously, they've been owned by local authorities. We took them on, but the level of underinvestment over many, many decades is such that some of those homes now are at the end of their life, and the only realistic option is that they should be demolished and replaced. In Merton, in southwest London, we have three estates that we are regenerating. That is going to cost us £1.3 billion. There's absolutely no excuse for any landlord, public or private, to leave housing in that sort of condition and, and not care for your tenants and the properties that you're responsible for. But of course, when housing associations are under financial pressure, it's harder for them to, you know, to maintain all of their properties and to do all of their jobs effectively. So in this next TikTok, I've decided to show some more housing horror stories that I've come across over the last few months. Oh! They've had issues with cockroaches and first complained about 10 years ago. The mold and damps eating through the wall. I became aware of Quajo's campaigning work very shortly after I arrived in this department. And some of the terrible living conditions that uh, he exposed are horrific. Um, the, the nature of poor social housing did not come as a surprise to me, but the extent of it has been shocking. I feel just neglected. I just don't even feel like I'm a human, like. Hold on. <gasps> what if my son was here? My son could have been sleeping there. And I'm tired of complaining. I don't want to be living in this condition. This is all, this is all mould. This is all mould. It looks like there's been a fire. It's terrible. I am on literally on the verge of nervous breakdown. Being a housing campaigner, speaking to, to people in social housing, even now, it just showed me that finances and money were seen as more of a priority than um, the people living in their homes. Councils are very cash strapped and we've seen the public money that was available for housing associations to keep them in good condition, to make themselves safe, safe and healthy. All of that has been stripped back by political decisions. People who are in the social housing sector, they have access to significant funds. They should shape up in many cases. Yes, we can have a robust debate about the allocation of resources from national government, but let's not always have uh, people who have a direct responsibility and professional leadership roles passing the buck. It's just not good enough. It's worth understanding just how low interest rates have been. 
I mean, if you're talking to somebody who age, who's age 30 now, they will think that interest rates of half a percent or one percent are normal. They're not. We have never seen rates anything like that. And then we had the pandemic, which just took everything we'd had before and cubed it. The UK prepares for a new reality as the country adapts to sweeping plans to tackle coronavirus with no clear end date in sight. Investors around the world have been gripped by fear that not just the human cost, but the financial cost of this virus. This is the Bank of England kind of on overdrive, trying to create a kind of airbed for the whole economy um, by cutting interest rates and 200 billion pounds of quantitative easing. It seemed to me to reflect a view that many central banks had at the time, which was, oh dear, here's some bad news. We better do some QE. That's not a very intelligent response to, uh, to setting monetary policy increase in the amount of money in the economy will lead to higher asset prices, higher house prices, higher spending, more inflation. To catalyze the housing market and boost confidence, I have decided today to cut stamp duty. London's housing market was hit by lockdown, but estate agents say there's been a massive surge in interest since the government announced a holiday on stamp duty. The property market in the southwest is booming. Demand is high, sales are up, houses are shifting and fast. Even with a pandemic, even with lockdown and economic slowdown, the average house price over the last 12 months has gone up about 24 and a half thousand pounds. The demand is unprecedented here in Ebu Vale, where there's only one word for it. It's bonkers. <laughs> When the bubble's inflating, it feels pretty good for everyone. There's, there's a financial feel-good effect, there's a political feel-good effect. So even politicians and governments that are determined not to allow financialised housing bubbles to emerge can find themselves riding them. This house would have been worth about 155,000 before pre-COVID. Um, and then since all of that happened and the lockdown came into situ in, in March, this house has now gone on the market for 214,000. Ultimately, it's completely unsustainable because you've got fewer and fewer people able to get on the housing ladder at all, so more and more of them are excluded. So they're unhappy and politically increasingly voicing that unhappiness. It just doesn't match up what the government is saying on the one hand about wanting to address the housing crisis and the policies that they're enacting which just pour fuel on the fire. And if I'm honest, I have some real concerns about mortgages right now. Most people are on cheap fixes, and they're expected when they end, they're going to be able to fix again at the same rate. Well, the rate is likely to be a lot higher, and they may not be able to get them, and that is a real problem coming forward. Is it all over, Prime Minister? A Prime Minister on the brink. We are now hearing that Boris Johnson will resign. I have just accepted Her Majesty the Queen's kind invitation to form a new government. Now is the time to tackle the issues that are holding Britain back. Today we are publishing our growth plan that sets out a new approach for this new era, yeah, yeah. reforming the supply side of the economy and cutting taxes to boost growth. The global markets react to the Prime Minister's economic plans. The cost of government borrowing shoots up and the pound plunges to an all-time low against the dollar. Tonight, a number of banks and lenders have stopped offering new mortgages because of the volatility in the currency markets. I've never seen a budget move the pound like this in my entire career. And whatever the Bank of England does, the markets are charging the UK ever higher prices for borrowing. The mortgage market is in shock. An unprecedented 935 mortgage products were withdrawn last night as lenders don't know how high interest rates will go.
once Jeremy Hunt was in place as Chancellor, I had a meeting with him where I pushed hard that I thought there was a potential mortgage ticking time bomb. On the back of that, the Chancellor called a mortgage summit. It was attended by the boss of the regulator, the boss of all the big banks, and me. I argued that we needed to be ready to try and prevent mortgage catastrophe for some people. Arrears, defaults, and repossessions. And I came up with a number of policies. And they were discussed, and there were lots of nods and agreements. That was December. But those measures were not enacted. These are the highest levels since the aftermath of the mini-budget crisis late last year. What our viewers want to know is what are your solutions? Dean Patterson has told mm. us, my mortgage is due for renewal. I'm due to pay double. Mike in Essex has said he can't sleep at the moment with the stress. His mortgage is going to go up by £500 a month. So what are you going to do about it? Well, the first thing is to make sure that we command the confidence of international and suddenly we were now at that ticking time bomb explosion period with mass panic from people coming off fixed rates going how on earth am i going to be able to pay the new bill and i felt a real frustration over this because the warning had been there so i put something on twitter basically saying they can't say they weren't warned On Friday, I met the UK's principal mortgage lenders. At that meeting, I secured agreement from lenders to a new mortgage charter, new support for people struggling with their mortgage payments. The boom in residential property in Britain, which has gone on over the last 25 years, has been an absolute disaster. It has turned housing, which is a social need, into an investment asset which has made property inaccessible to younger generations. And I think all politicians should think very hard about that. If they speak to young people up and down the country, young people like me, and ask them about owning their own property, they're going to say to you it's so unattainable at the moment that they've almost come to terms with the fact that for now it's not going to happen. Fundamentally, the housing system is not working for the majority, but it is working for landlords, for developers and for the people with multiple homes. What's different about the UK housing market that impacts where we build and how we rent our homes? To watch exclusive insights from government and housing market experts, go to bbc.co.uk slash Britain's housing crisis and follow the links to the Open University.